Hello, I'm Danny Webster from Line Microsystems and today I'm talking about the real radio link. So we're going to look at uh, uh, the noise floor and the line of sight link budget, uh, the issue of bad neighbours or interference, and then the effect of uh, uh, receiver propagation effects on uh, uh, the real signals. The radio link is a hostile environment and there's many things that can affect the performance of a radio. <coughs> there's the uh, effects internal to the radio receiver such as phase noise, DC offset, image rejection, crosstalk and spurs. There's the effect of other radio users producing co-channel interference, adjacent channel interference, out-of-band interference and downright deliberate jamming. There's propagation effects such as line of sight, uh, path loss, urban canyons and other obstacles, uh, multipath fading with echoes, uh, absorption, um, the effect of the ionosphere and solar flares, weather related phenomena, uh, cosmic noise and of course antennas. So one of the limits on the sensitivity of a, a receiver is the thermal noise floor of the system. And this is partially determined by how hot the receiver is and partially by excess noise produced by the electronics. <coughs> so a classic equation is shown here and um, uh, typically it's about minus 174 dBm per hertz is the thermal noise uh, floor of a real RF system. And uh, a radio receiver such as the Lime SDR would typically produce a couple dBs of excess noise corresponding to a noise figure of about two or three dBs. So one of the questions we get asked is how sensitive is a receiver? And uh, uh, this is one of those questions where there's no real one single answer. Uh, it's affected by a number of effects such as temperature, bandwidth, system noise figure, the uh, signal type, its modulation, its error correction, uh, encoding uh, techniques and uh, code gains, as well as losses, filters, switches, antennas and so on. The signal is usually described by a parameter called EB over N0, which is the energy per bit to uh, noise spectral density. And for an unencoded QPSK signal, this would be about 7 or 8 dB. Uh, if we add something like turbo coding to the same signal, this then reduces to about minus 0.5 uh, dB. So as you can see, we can get something like 8 or 9 dB improvement in the sensitivity of our receiver just by using uh, error correction techniques. Antennas uh, uh, are very useful to us in terms of uh, controlling um, our exposure to interference by using directional antennas, but more often we want to use omnidirectional antennas such as dipoles and patch antennas. Uh, usually these are related to a fictional antenna called the Hertzian dipole, which gives uniform behavior in all three directions and is used as a, uh, a reference figure. Uh, typically we would see something like one or two dB gain in a dipole or a monopole antenna, whereas a directional antenna such as a Yagi array, we could see something as much as 18 dB of antenna gain and similar figures for a helical antenna. <coughs> the next thing to uh, consider is the propagation loss and this is defined by Fry's propagation equation, which describes the effect of distance, wavelength and antenna gains on the received signal strength relative to the transmit uh, signal strength. So typically you see something like 45 dB a loss for indoor applications, uh, 70 dB a loss for outdoor uh, applications in the range of a couple kilometers, and about 180 dB of loss for uh, satellite systems with, uh, say, 25,000 kilometer uh, orbit uh, ranges. 
So the signal is affected by what's called multi-path fading, and this consists of a direct line of sight signal, a refracted path through the uh, varying layers of the atmosphere, a reflected path off of any uh, static or mobile objects such as mountains or cars. And this can be um, described uh, by uh, a number of fading model models. So Ricean fading model uh, talks about a situation where one path is dominant but the other paths are time changing and Raleigh fading where all paths have similar levels and there's a probability description. So a 30 dB margin in the link budget leads to about 99.9% .9 chance of reception, whereas a 20 dB link budget leads to a 90% reception uh, probability. So obstructions, can radio waves pass through walls? Yes but the signal is made smaller and it all depends what the wall is made of, what the frequency is and what the phase of the moon is and so on. Uh, so can radio waves go around corners? Yes they can uh, through uh, edge diffraction. It's a lossy effect but nevertheless you can see signals below the uh, uh, visible horizon. Here we have a selection of link budgets using just the Lime SDR without any external power amplifier for a range of popular uh, modulation schemes. So for something like DAB, uh, you're looking at 0.5 kilometer range. Uh, for uh, digital television, uh, maybe something like uh, 30 meters. Uh, GSM, about 0.8 kilometers. Uh, WCDMA, 2.6 kilometers. Uh, LT depends on uh, uh, bandwidth, but typically in the order of uh, 100 meters down to about 20 meters. Uh, Wi-Fi is relatively short, um, and some of the other ones such as Zigbee are about a quarter of a kilometer. Obviously if you put an external power amplifier on, you can considerably extend these ranges. And if you use directional antennas for point-to-point -point links, again, you can further improve the ranges on these uh, uh, signals. So let's have a look at a very simple um, DAB system here. So you want to set up your own radio station in your house and broadcast to your unlucky neighbors. Um, so for example, half a kilometer, we got about 73 dB of attenuation through uh, the atmosphere. Uh, we would have a sensitivity of something like 101 dBm, so we have a link margin of about 30 dBs. If we go further out, some, something like 3 kilometers, uh, we now got an 88.6 uh, dB propagation loss, and our link margin is now dropping to 11 dB. So we can claw back on some of these things by using a highly directional antenna to give us something like 20 dB gain which will then give us the uh, 30 dB link margin again. So one of the most surprising uh, things about radio propagation is that it's actually affected not only by what we do here on Earth, but by events in outer space. So for example, a thunderstorm on Jupiter can affect uh, the noise uh, being picked up by your radio system. Uh, things such as uh, uh, solar fl flares and uh, the state of the ionosphere can severely affect uh, co-channel interference in the VHF bands. Uh, temperature inversion can lead to extremely long uh, propagation uh, paths. Uh, I think in some cases you can see uh, something like 300 kilometer ranges uh, despite being out of line of sight. And obviously there's things like reflection of lightning and absorption and so on in meteors. Uh, it's a fascinating subject. Uh, most of the time we can ignore this, but uh, for VHF it's particularly uh, a consideration. So can we use the Lime SDR for space communications? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, the Lime SDR will work very happily with an active antenna uh, for GNSS uh, satellite uh, detection. 
and with an external power amplifier and a bit of uh, know-how and uh, patience, you could even do the famous moon bounce um, propagation case. Uh, have a look at the numbers here. Um, moon, uh, moon bounce propagation is about 250 dB power loss. Uh, whereas the uh, GPS is about 184 dB uh, power for loss. So you're looking at some very tiny signals uh, coming back. Obviously all radios are affected by Doppler shift, so if your transmit path includes a moving object or is from a moving object, then you can see small shifts in carrier frequency. In most cases, it's not a problem, but for something like GPS, where you have relatively long uh, signal um, patterns, um, a four kilohertz uh, phase shift, uh, frequency shift, can be um, quite significant, and you actually have to scan the Doppler shifts when you're trying to detect the satellites. Okay, let's have a look at the area now of bad neighbors. This is perhaps um, the most important subject for radio uh, system designers. Uh, John Donne, in his 1624 writing, wrote that no man is an island. And this is especially true for urban radio links. We are surrounded by radio links, from UHF TV transmission, uh, VHF radio transmission, uh, mobile telephones, point-to-point and satellite links, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth devices, and coming out now 5G, Internet of Things, and many more. So the question is, is how do we live with bad neighbors, and how not to be a bad neighbor? So the answer to the first question is through the use of RF uh, saw filtering to select what bands we're listening to, and the other is through the use of directional antennas where that's possible. So here we see a sort of uh, bar chart description of the uh, bad neighbor problem. So the biggest bad neighbor, of course, is the local TV transmitter. Uh, in a big uh, city such as London, we have a 100 kilowatt uh, transmitter in Crystal Palace, and that corresponds to plus 80 dBm of output power. Whereas if you're looking at a GPS signal, that's coming in about minus 120 dBm, or if you like, one femtowatt. That's a lot of zeros in the other direction. So we have some extreme ranges in amplitude in the radio environment. Uh, whereas things like Wi-Fi and cell phones are perhaps more intermediate in the 100 milliwatt to 2 watt uh, range. So this leads to some uh, uh, huge challenges in the design of a uh, transceiver, which the Lime SDR was designed to do. So it requires low noise figure, uh, very low far out phase noise, uh, good 1 dB compression and uh, second and third order intercept point, and a good ADC. And in many cases, your own transmitter is your worst interferer in a, a co-located system. Okay, so how do we not be a bad neighbor? We need to think about other radio users. So one approach is a spread spectrum signal, where you transmit a low signal over a wide bandwidth. Uh, the other approach is using uh, uh, RF band select filters, which remove harmonic responses uh, and, and any spurs that are coming from various parts of the radio. Uh, the use of pulse-shaped filtering to minimize adjacent channel interference. Uh, using directional antenna to transmit the power where you want it to go, rather than to broadcasting it in every direction. So only transmit with the power you really need for your link. Uh, usually there's some local licensing restrictions on what power you can transmit in what frequency. So in the UK this is from Ofcom. So there's a number of bands uh, in the VHF and UHF and the Wi-Fi bands which are usually uh, license exempt and uh, providing you're below a certain power level, uh, you can use these frequency bands for your experiments. So let's have a look at some of the effects of uh, some of these uh, unfortunate propagation and undesirable effects on a, a radio link. 
So here we have a uh, QPS signal and we're adding thermal noise. So instead of getting a nice crisp uh, single point, we're now getting something that looks like a uh, shotgun uh, blast. So if the, the noise is sufficiently uh, small, then there's no interference between the symbols. If the noise becomes larger, which we'll look at later, uh, we will actually find there's inter-symbol interference, and this leads to a uh, degradation of the quality of the receiver. Things such as IQ gain and mismatch and phase mismatch can lead to um, a distortion of the uh, QAM constellation. Uh, obviously, you can train your software to correct for that. Uh, phase noise produces this sort of rotational noise, so usually of only a few degrees, but it's enough to uh, uh, produce this dislocation. So if you're using a high-density phase shift keying technique, this phase noise can begin to affect the performance of your radio link. Uh, frequency error, uh, or Doppler shift if you like, causes a phase shift that is time-dependent. Uh, Multipath signals can cause uh, some strange effects, such as repeating the uh, um, CRAM signals uh, by giving you a delayed version of your original signal and leading to some form of intersymbol interference. Uh, fading is a key concern, so you can have one moment a very healthy signal, and then as time changes, it can drop to zero and then come back up again. So as you can see, the radio link is a very hostile environment with behavior changing with time, location, weather, and even space events. Uh, it's possible to calculate a nominal link budget for normal operating conditions. Uh, the maximum range of a radio uh, depends on many, many factors. And the receiver itself can also degrade performance, so it's important to calibrate and set up and do RF matching. And there's a lot we can do to be bad neighbours, and there's a lot we can do not to be bad neighbours.